Hey everyone, welcome on into the ClayShare studio. I am Jessica Putnam Phillips, the founder of ClayShare, and we have got all of the pieces we glazed during ClayShare Con and a few extras in the kiln right here behind me. So last Wednesday, we did our five day online ceramic conference. It's free or was free because it's already happened. And we had five days of demos, tutorials, uh, studio tours, factory tours. We had a raku firing. We had glazing, we had hand building, we had wheel throwing, we had carving. Um, we had all kinds of stuff happening during that. And uh, we gave away a whole bunch of stuff too. So it was fabulous. It was great. I'm glad you liked it, Diana. It was really fun. We had a blast doing it. So I see people asking about surgery. That's tomorrow. Surgery is tomorrow morning at 9.30, folks. I've gotten a lot of messages from everybody. 9.30 tomorrow morning. I'll be having this hand carpal tunnel release. So uh, it'll be fun. It'll be all great. I'll let y'all know how it goes. So we did all this, um, all this stuff on it for ClayShareCon, and you can actually go back and watch all of that for free. If you go to ClayShare.com, you can go ahead and watch it there. You can download the ClayShare app and watch it there as well. Just scroll down till you see ClayShareCon, and then you watch all the videos. They're all there. There's like 30-something videos, almost 40, maybe more. I have no idea. None whatsoever. So hey, 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 everybody. Thank you for all of the, the good thoughts from my surgery tomorrow and prayers and everything. Yay! You're excited to see what comes out of the box. What's in the magic hot box? We're gonna find out. All right, we're not gonna wait because I got lots to get done. And we will be having a primetime broadcast for my premium members. You'll all be watching, I hope. That's gonna be happening at 6.15 tonight. Okay. So I'll tell you a bit about what my firing was because I know you guys are going to want to know. This is an LNL E23T kiln with a vent. You can see the vents back there. It connects through the bottom. I fired it with a one and a half hour preheat. I fired it on medium speed with a, I do a 13 minute hold because of my kiln has been fired 52 times and the elements are getting a little older. So I do a 13 minute hold at the top and then that's it. It's done. It's to cone five. So that's what we got in here. You're anxious for a kiln opening. So let's take a look at the cone pack. The only true way to know what your, what your kiln did as far as heat work is through your cone packs. So you make these or you um, buy little plaques to stand them up in or self-supporting cones, your choice. And we did classes and broadcasts. We've talked about cones before. So you have three cones here. The middle one is the one you want. And then you have your guide cone, that's one below, and guard cone, that's one above. So this is cone four, cone five, cone six. As you can see, my cone five cone is completely bent over and melted. So I know I get a nice solid cone five melt, which is different than the numbers because the melting is the heat work and that's what matters when you're talking about glazing. You're talking about the glazes melting. So if your kiln on the little box here tells you it got to the temperature of cone five, but you don't have melted glazes properly, then the heat work wasn't correct. So there's a little, there's a little bit of tech stuff. It's a true cone five, exactly, it's true. And I had it resting on a little piece of kiln shelf so that if it overfired, which it, I mean, it could happen, it would not melt onto my shelf and make a big old mess. All right, so we did this a few weeks ago in a live broadcast. We did a glazing um, night, of, and this was a plate, this is, my town, that's the pattern on this one. And this is Amico Aquacelladon, three coats with lustrous jade on the rim. And if I flip it over, you can see the lustrous jade there on the rim. And I think I'm gonna adjust my lighting just a bit because I feel like it's not giving it the, the proper respect that glaze needs. Look at how yummy that is right there where the two come together. So a great one for texture, Amico Aqua, Amico Lustrous Jade. You just got your kiln, woo! It's super exciting getting your own kiln. And then here's a piece that I, I told you there's a few extra. I didn't glaze this during Clay Share Con. This is from my, it's actually my Cherry Blossom Bowl class, but we also made a leaf bowl in that class. This is, really a fun little one. And in the class, in the class I glaze it with three Amico Celadons, but I wanted to do something a little different. So I used red iron oxide 
and I painted that on. You can see the little veining in the leaves there. See, you can really see it. I also did a band of it around the rim and then on the foot ring. And then I glazed it in my Oribe, which is from Clayscapes Pottery. That's where they, they sell my glazes. And I, I actually used tongs and I held it like this with the tongs and I dunked it all the way in and pulled it right back out. Now my Oribe you can get as a brush on glaze too, but this is the dip, dip version. Dip, 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 dip. So Oribe, that's it, with red iron oxide. That's all that's happening on this bowl. But isn't this so sweet with some green leaves? I like it a lot. Came out great. All right, we're gonna, we're gonna leave that there for a minute because I don't want you to see what's below. Gotta make you wait. This one right here was our ombre glazing with Mako Stroke and Coats. And we did hot tamale, uh, coral, orange appeal, and we layered them on right here. And there's the top. With the white, that white is the Mako Light Flux. I'm not sure I like it so much. I don't know. It's kind of me. But it's not bad. But you can see how we get this really nice gradient on the pot. I'm trying to get rid of the glare for you. But you get these bands like a sunset. And we did two, so we have another one in here. But this one came out really nice. And this right here um, was brush, brushing on. It's really simple to do. And that piece I actually made an extruder. Ooh, the, was the watercolor pottery, that was day five. The last day we'd painted this together. And this one took about an hour to hand paint and I applied Speedball Underglaze watered down. You could do any underglaze you prefer to work with. It's entirely up to you. That's just my underglaze of choice. And then I put my, I use a clear 2167, my studio clear. And then that's my chun on the rim. So that's that beautiful chun blue. So if you like these colors, look at that. Look how great that turned out. It is amazing. I'm so happy with how it, how that, watercolor effect. I mean, you look, this one especially, well, you can really see the edges. Do you see the edges where we have the gradients happening? Turned out great. Great, great, great. So that's a happy little vase. Signature on the bottom. Turned out nice. So, all right. So you're trying to brush, trying your brush on first. If it looks good, then you'll get more so you can dip pieces. Right, and although the brush on, it will re it'll act differently than the dip and pour they always do, but it'll give you a good color test and translucency test. So you'll, you'll have it for that, but not too shabby. This was Mishima hand carved design. All we had was the black inlay to begin with, bisque fired it, and then we added the color during the bisque. And I don't know if you can actually see texture. Like if you can see the lines, the actual carved, quality of those lines. I don't think the camera can show, but you can feel it. You feel the bumps because each one of these lines was hand carved into the pot. So that's a oh, happy pot. That's a good one. And it was carved when it was greenware. Yes, it was wheel thrown. When it was leather hard, I carved it, did the inlay, and I actually showed how to do Mishima, the modern Mishima during Clayshare Con. And, and I have a class. Oh, what is this beautiful little thing? Wow, look, I gotta adjust. Let me adjust Instagram. The folks on Instagram can't see as well, and I wanna help them out, because, you know, they don't always get the best view, but they should, they should have a good view. All right, look at this. This right here is ancient copper, three coats on the top, and then on the bottom, I did deep sea celadon. So it's Amico's deep sea celadon. Look at the carving. And then where the two came together, what did I put in there? Do we remember what did I do? Was that lustrous jade or did I use light flux? Light flux. Yeah, that was the light flux. Look what it did. What? That's crazy good. I'm really happy with that. How's that camera working as far as getting the detail? Boom. Nice, right? So the, oh, and a little flux on the inside to see what would happen. So the um, ancient copper from Amico. Sometimes it'll be matte, sometimes it'll be a shinier, more metallic. This one went a little more of a matte. I really, this, this right here. Sometimes you'll have a spot on a pot that is just the yummy spot or the sweet spot. That's that spot there. Really nice. I know, love the ancient copper. 
me too. So that came out, that came out good. And then we have a set, this is a dip chiller set. So we glaze them to match. We did the little dip bowl and we did the chiller. So this is the dip bowl and this is the dip chiller. Oh, what do we think of these? So I'll tell you, it was smoky Merlot, three coats inside and out on the top half. And then I did the oolong gloss on the bottom. So that's, these are all Amico. And then where they met, I did Lustrous Jade. So if you love this right here, that's happening right there, that's Lustrous Jade over oolong gloss. Isn't that nice? And so look, they, you don't fire them together, but they fit together. And the way they work is you put your ice in here, you put your dip in your little bowl and you drop it in there. Or if you're just thinking that gorgeousness is too beautiful to hide, which I'm gonna look at the bottom of that too, which it kinda is. Um, I like to do dip and then like carrot sticks or celery sticks in here, celery or carrot sticks in here, and they stand up, right? Or if you have big hands, this is, a, this is your glass. You know, I don't know, you got some nuts in here, maybe some snacks in here, and you've got your drink in here. I, I don't know, you pick, right? You can have fun. And so this clay right here was Laguna B-Mix 5. These pieces were wheel thrown. I do have a class on making your own dip chiller. So my members, if you guys wanna learn how to throw these two parts, you can do that. And they turned out spectacular. We don't glaze them like this in the class. We used some Mako glazes, but, uh, Yum! You need to make one. Yes. <laughs> we will have more giveaways down the line. I'm not sure what we'll do, but we'll have something. We'll have something. Um, all right, moving on into the kiln. So what we have here, oh, we have a piece we glazed a few weeks ago on a broadcast that this is only the, is this only the second glaze firing I've done in the big kiln? I've been using my baby kiln for everything. So this is a piece we did, and it looks crazy, doesn't it? I used the Amico Celadons. This was a textured bowl I made with my daisy stamps. And then I used Sharon Hoppy's um, form, her shoppy shape. And I know I'm always telling you the products that I use, because you know what happens if I don't tell you what I used in here? I will get a 112 emails with people saying, where did you get the form? Or where did you get the stamps? If I tell you now, you might be watching and you're like, I don't care about that. Okay, you don't, you don't need to know the information, that's fine. But those of you who do care about that, now you have it. And that's why I share. So I put the Amico Tangelo Celadon on the entire thing, except trying to avoid the flowers. And then I did Poppy Celadon on the outside ring of the flowers, and the very center was marigold celadon. So they came out looking a little bit like spots. <laughs> I don't know, it's kind of cute. I like it. It's very bright and cheery um, and very happy. So chicken wings in the bottom and sauce on top for the dip chiller. Mm -hmm. Is that your plan? Okay, yeah, we're gonna. You're gonna reach right in for those chicken wings. That's kind of deep, but uh, that, it's, it's the price you're willing to pay. For you're willing to pay that price. I might not be. Um, so I did something a little simple. We carved this a couple weeks ago, maybe a month ago. I was doing a trimming with Diamond Core Tools demo, and I decided to use the trimming tools to carve. And so this was a cup I carved, and then I bis fired it, and while it was bisked. After it was done, I stained this with royal blue speedball underglaze. So I brushed that on here and I brushed it on here. Then I wiped it back. So you can kind of see because it was wiped back, it's a little uneven, like we have a vintagey effect going on. And then I dipped the entire thing in my chun blue. So it's just one dip. I filled it on the inside, poured it out, and then I put my hand inside and I blooped it down in the bucket. So that's how I dip and pour. So this turned out turned out really sweet. It's just a simple little cup with that little cloud pattern carved into it. Just fits the hand nicely too. This is a good, this is a good cup. It's a good shape. Ah, ha, ha. we made this when, so almost everything in here is something we made in a broadcast. 
This we made during our flexi bat. Um, we we're hand building, I think, with flexi bats because flexi bat made my logo into a flexi bat, and so it's on the bottom. There's my logo on the bottom. I didn't glaze the bottom. I left it raw. I like the way it looks. And then I used Mako Stroke and Coat, the white that's cotton tail, and then I used their um, orange here and their blue heaven here because it matches my my chun which is what I glazed the actual mug with. So you can see the texture. I don't know if the texture is coming through and you all can see, but this, this glaze is a good one. That's my chun for texture. So look at that. So how would I advise someone just learn, interested in uh, starting to learn, watch videos, go check out clayshare.com and check out my intro to wheel throwing and intro to hand building. They're free. You can watch those and it talks a bit about both techniques and you can start there. So th is there any more questions? I don't want to, <laughs> I, you love that I give the details and you can rewatch. Believe it or not, I sometimes get emails from people who don't like that I say the manufacturers of the products that I use because they think it's too commercial. But the fact is if someone wants to get this exact color, I'm going to tell them what I use to get that color and where they buy it or if they even buy it, it's entirely up to them. They don't have to, but you know, I give everybody the info because I want you to have all the knowledge and you make your decisions to do with that. You get the knowledge and then you figure out what to do with that knowledge. Okay, let's keep going. Where can you get logos made? I hired a graphic designer to do mine. Um, did we use Fiverr, Kev, to find her? We did. We used Fiverr. F-I-V-R is an app. You go to it and you can find a graphic designer to design a logo for you. We already kind of had a basic logo going. And for our company, for Clayshare, we wanted a logo that symbolized community and had to do with making and helping each other out. And so our logo, we can talk about, we'll talk about my logo, is two hands making a pot together. And the blue is to symbolize my chun blue, because that's my signature glaze. And then the coral color, it's not supposed to be so orange, it's a little more coral, is for fire, but also symbolizes friendship and community. And it's in the shape of a beautiful vase because we make pottery here. So that's, you know, we worked with a graphic designer. I think we paid six, seven hundred dollars to have our logo designed. We went back and forth and had revisions, multiple revisions because I'm a difficult customer apparently. But in the end, I got exactly what I wanted. I have a logo that is perfect for my company, for my branding, and I use on everything now. Well, you got more than a logo too. You got I, did get, brand guide. I did get a brand guide. I got much more than a logo. He's right. Ooh, here's the little ombre one right here. So what do I do with all these pieces? So a lot of these come from classes. They will become examples of glaze combos for future classes or for reference because we are a teaching studio and people will say, well, what happens if I do blah, 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 blah. And then my, if I'm in a live broadcast, I'll be like, well, this is it right here. Uh, sometimes I'll have sales and uh, we'll I'll sell some of the pieces. It's a crazy idea. But um, yeah, but usually I, I, you know, I usually sell them. So this was a planter. There's a hole in it. Wait, can you see the hole? You kind of can see the hole. It's down in there. And we glazed this with teal next time, jaded, overlapped them. And then I think we did white and tried to blend it in. So it, it came out not the colors I thought it would, but I'm not unhappy with this sweet little planter. It's clay share and sharing is what it's all about. Exactly. That's how I came up with the company name is I was teaching people how to make pottery. I was sharing my love of clay with everybody, you know, sharing clay. And I was like, it's clay share because we're sharing clay. It just, yeah, worked out. <laughs> so that one, that one's pretty good. Can you refire a piece that you are not happy with? Yes, you can. It may not come out the way you wanted it to come out the first time, but it'll probably be better than the way it is now. You just have to be willing to put it back in the kiln, in the kiln after you reglaze it and just see what happens because you never know. Ooh, oh, oh my. Okay, we did the spin art demo. You remember the spin art demo on I don't know what day of ClayshareCon? I also have a full length class on ClayShare that, that shows this. These are Georgie's glazes. We started with, what was the base? The purple velvet. And then I used, um, goodness gracious, I think I used Tidal Pool 
and I think I used the Cherry Fizz or Neon Orange, I can't remember which. You guys would have to go watch the demo, but look how great, look how great that came out. Like it's a little more subtle than the one that I've been sharing pictures of. And there's the back. And this one has those hangers we were talking about so that I can put a little picture wire in here and hang it on the wall. So, we, if, so if anybody's buying something and they're like, I don't have any more cabinet space, you're like, fix that problem for you. Just hang it on your wall. And when you want it, you pull it down. You stainless steel hanging uh, wire and you'll never have to worry about rusting. It's a very retro 70s, it is, but it's great. It's very great. And it can, this is on Laguna B-Mix. Thanks, Michael. The planter looks like a landscape. It does, I know. It didn't come out like a beach, but it looks more like a mountain-y, right? Fields and, skies. Fields and skies. Like a hand on the ball of clay, my logo. It, yeah, I mean, it's, it does. The way, you, oh, you know you're right. So when you think about when you're centering, right, you got your hands together. There, it's actually hands interlocked like this, but it's still an idea that you got the hands coming together. Ooh, good pots. And some of these, I'm trying, I'm like, did I write down what we did? <laughs> this, uh, we were talking about using Mako glazes on textured pieces. This is Mako's green opal. And then on the rim, I believe I did the dark flux on the rim is what we did on this one. And then I think I went back and put another layer of the green opal. But if you want a bright plate, woo! And we only did one coat on the back on my signature. Right there. Do you like this bright color? And so my mom says this reminds her of the pants my mother wore on their first date. My dad, yes, my dad was colorblind and he showed up to pick my mom up for their very first date. They were set up by my uncle. My uncle set my mom up for my, with my dad because my mom wouldn't date my uncle. But, and my uncle said, I bet you date my brother. And my mom says, I bet I would. She didn't know who he was at all, but she did date him. Must have liked him with his bright green pants because she married him and had a couple kids. So I guess it worked out. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that date was a winner. <laughs> so this, this is nice, right? Mom, do you want the plate for memories? I actually really like the plate. And the color is green opal. And on the rim, we did dark flux. I remember we did dark flux and then light flux on top of the dark flux. This was a double fluxing. We did, we were playing with the Mako Flux during that broadcast, and we did dark flux first and then light flux on top. Um, and you can actually tell when you look at the back, dark flux band, light flux band, and the very edge, I put another little swatch of the green opal. So if you like a chartreuse green, that two coats lets you see your texture, because this does. And it really, in person, you really see it. And this texture isn't such that if you put it on a dinner plate, you're gonna worry about food getting caught in it and it being a problem to clean. This glaze, this will, this will clean off really easy. So easy. Jess's town is cheery and sunny. It is. Jess's town is a happy place to live. We all can live in Jess's town. So that is a happy plate. So far, I have nothing I'm mad at, so that's a good thing. And I have a great big platter in the bottom, the one we glazed Monday morning during Good Morning Clay Share. That is in the bottom of this. Ooh, oh, yes. Oh, oh no. I can't even. Hello, we'll just, shall we just pause here? So we can look at this inside. This is a bubble bowl. That's what I call this shape because it's like a bubble. I think I threw one during Clay Share Con. I think we made a bubble bowl. Um, so lavender mist, right? And then on top we did Mako dark flux, light flux, and a band of lavender mist. 
So all that is on here is dark flux about to here, light flux to about there, let me turn it this way, dark flux to about here, right? Light flux to about here, and then a band of lavender mist. And did we glaze this during Clay Share Con? Was this the Melty Mako glaze one? Yes, so. Yeah, so in the Clay Share Con mel glazing, Melty Mako glazes, wait, you have to see it from the bottom to really appreciate the yummy. Uh-huh, uh-huh. It feels good too. I love this combo. I think I've got a new favorite. It looks like ice cream. Mmm. You know, I was told when you get carpal tunnel surgery, it's good to eat a lot of ice cream afterwards when you're stuck, not able to work. Like lots and lots of ice cream in a beautiful bowl like this. Did, are, did they recommend any flavors? Well, butter pecan is always a winner and you get some caramel sauce and you drizzle it on top and some whipped cream and that makes the patient very happy during recovery. <laughs> yeah, so this one came out great. Um, I'm trying to hold it still. It's hard because I'm trying to turn it too because I want you to see the, the beautiful colors. Now, I, I did wipe back here at the bottom. You see how it's a, a lighter, like a brown color? Because I knew this would run, and if we look, we have one spot it ran down, but it didn't come close. It's just right there. It got, it got to it, but it didn't go any further. But oh my goodness. So try this combo. Um, did you guys see inside though? I mean, can you see inside? Is that light able to get down in there? I'm trying to turn it so you can really see. <laughs> Maybe I'll go this way. I don't know if it can focus on it. Oh, you got it. You got it? Yeah. Look inside. The whole inside of the bowl is like that. That's the ice cream bowl. Oh, good, right? Um, they didn't give you that advice, but it sounds good to you. Yes, I have a very good doctor. <laughs> the eating the ice cream was highly recommended. <laughs> or at least I thought that's what he said to me. I thought that's what he said when he was telling me to keep the hand elevated and not use it. I was pretty sure he mentioned eat lots of ice cream. <laughs> yeah, I don't really need much encouragement to do that. Okay, we got a couple more bowls. So this one is, is still beautiful. Ice cream is good. Whiskey, whiskey works wonders though. Through the pain, I know. So that glaze on this one, I'm sorry, I'll recap. This was Mako Lavender Mist. Uh, I think we did two good coats, two and a half coats. And then on top we put dark flux, light flux, and then a band of the lavender mist on the very tippy top of the rim. That's it. It wasn't anything, um, it was not a fancy combo. It's simple. It's really simple. This is Mako's Blue Opal on first. So you can see it there inside and outside. So the entire thing was two coats of Blue Opal. Two coats outside, I think three coats on the inside. And then I used Night Moth, two coats, just two coats of the Night Moth. And you see we got some melties happening. Now Night Moth is a glaze, if you go a little heavier with it, it'll run more. I didn't put any flux on it. Look how pretty that is inside the bowl. Isn't that sweet? I love this combo. It is like Starry Night from Van Gogh. It's beautiful, right? The dark sky looks like Van Gogh's, yeah. Tatiana is thinking the same thing as I am. Yeah. And I see there's some questions. How many times can you reglaze a piece? And I'll, I'll, honestly, you can do it as many times as you want. Every time you fire it again, you're heating it up and cooling it down. So potentially, you're stressing out the clay. You could cause it to be a little more brittle, but I have fire plates, the soldier plates behind me. Those guys get fired like 12 times as part of the process. And it, and it works. So, yeah, so this is really a nice combo too. How many coats of the lavender mist on this one? Two to three, your choice. On this, I did two, you can actually see, I think I did three on the inside, two on the outside. So you can see the difference. When you go to that third coat, you see how the lavender, um, it's lighter. Two coats, do you see it's a little darker right there? You can kind of see. 
So it's your choice as far as what you like for, for a finish. And this is the bowl I remade my daughter because her other one got broken. And this is Amico Deep Sea with seaweed on the rim. And you can see it's for my child because her name is on the back. And whoa, look at this. She'll be very happy to have a bowl again. She's been using one of mine and I get a little nervous that something could happen. But uh, three coats of deep sea and two coats of seaweed on this to get the drippies. And we encouraged the drips. Remember, we encouraged the drips in certain places so we could get that running happening here. You get that little drippiness going on. Birthdays! I, am I seeing birthdays? Everybody sharing birthdays coming up. Happy birthday, everybody. So you lose half the pieces you refire because they crack, Chris says. So are you doing a nice medium fire? Like, don't go fast fire on a refire. You still have to baby the pieces because if you fire it too fast, you could stress it out. It's just too much thermal shock for the piece to, um, to deal with. Was that? That's that shelf. We've got, we've got a couple more. How are we at for time? We're doing so good. Ah, this was a really great piece, and we don't. Do we have? We don't have the overhead camera on tonight. No, we don't. No overhead tonight. Um, sorry, folks. We're being lazy on the job. This was a. We clay. We did this with using Georgie's interactive pigments for texture, for highlighting texture. And I used a whole bunch of Georgie's pigments. We painted them in each little square and then I wiped back. And then the glaze on top is two coats of Georgie's satin, translucent satin. And so we have, I'm moving it from side to side so you can see very little glare. With two light coats, we, um, two light coats, we still see plenty of texture. The pattern is from Sharon Hoppy. It's her Jetsons pattern. I love it. Uh, how long do I fire my glaze? So I do a medium speed. I do a one and a half hour preheat and a hold for 13 minutes at the top. This kiln fired for 13 hours and nine minutes. So that's about how long it takes for my glaze fire. Usually 12 to 14 hours, depends. And there's the back, just, just the glaze, no color. So. I'll try to name them, but I can't remember. You can go watch that for free, the glazing tutorial right here. But uh, if you get Georgie's Interactive Pigment Set, these all come with them except the satin. Translucent satin is an extra glaze you would have to buy separately. They don't sell that. In, that's not in the kit. Um, it's one I got separate. So uh, indigo is the blue, steel black, and then we also have, I think these are steel black, and I think this is winter storm here. We have the coppery one, which is sand and surf, right there. This one over here is the golden straw, there and there. The brown, uh, I think that's wormwood. And I must have done autumn foliage somewhere, so I honestly would have to go back and rewatch the video. But it looks like a quilt, and I hold it this way because it fits the frame perfect, so you can see the whole thing. But what do you think? This came out great, and just a sweet little, sweet little tray. Amico Satin Matte Clear give the similar finish. So you can use anybody's satin clear, but you won't get the same colors. Georgie's pigments really work best with Georgie's glazes. They were made that way. That's why they did that. But you will get a result. It won't look exactly the same though, but it could be similar. But I'm happy with that. And I didn't know, I was wondering about it. I was like, oh, I'm kind of thinking it could be iffy, but actually I love it enough. I think I'd like to do some bigger pieces with it. Maybe even some mugs, yes. Wouldn't this be great as a mug? You know, this pattern or a, my Moroccan tile would be a good one too. And you could do each little square like a quilt, right? So the next thing, I think we just have one thing left, and that is my rooster plate that I did the pigmenting. 
So we did the staining with the sand and surf pigment during clay share con, and then I was gonna glaze it, but my glaze was having some issues, some of you remember, but it was actually really, really good that that happened because I ended up using a different glaze, which I like better, and Yes, I fired this on the bottom. No, it did not crack. Yes, I use alumina hydrate because it's big, so it moved. We do have alumina hydrate on the foot ring, but it's just powder and I'll just wipe it off. But are you ready? This is my big rooster platter. The pigment was sand and surf. The glaze is zinc free clear. Look at him. How cute is this little rooster? I love it. And I did on purpose leave the rim unglazed. I wanted this vintage feel. And I love how it turned out. It's supposed to look old and worn away in places. And that's the whole point of this technique. So, how do I get lines in the crack without color on top? If you mean in here, I stain it and then I wipe back with a sponge. So you're staining the recessed areas and wiping the top off. And that's what I did here as well. You stain the surface. So you're applying whatever pigment or slip or underglaze or whatever, and then you're wiping back the excess. So this one turned out great. Is this the one that cracked? This is not, nope. The one that cracked is sitting over there. This one, listen, now you can hear it. Hear the ring? If it was cracked, it would be dong. It would be donk. It wouldn't be. It's like a bell. I'm excited. And since I'm moving into the new house on Sunday, ha, ha, this is my good luck platter. It's going with me. Hopefully I don't break it. So do I have class with working on Amico's opalescence? Those are low fire. I don't have one right now, but I am going to be doing some more low fire. I have a lot of like glazing with Amico but and with Mako with their crystal glazes, but not with the opalescence. But I will. <laughs> yeah, so this, this one, the patchwork one turned out great. Um, I do think, oh, I like to share my favorite pieces from a firing. This is gonna be hard, really hard. Um, well, is it really hard? Not really. This is my favorite, but but that's pretty spectacular, right? But these right here, right? These, these guys, I think these, this counts as one piece. I think these are my favorite from the kiln. I, I'm in love with this. I need to do more of this combo right here for dishes in my life and this one too. So what does the alumina hydrate do? It's a good question. So when we're firing great big pieces like this, they expand and contract as they heat up and cool down in the kiln. They need to have a way to move. So think of like little ball bearings or something under them to help them roll and go bigger to expand and then contract. If they don't have that, as they're trying to contract, they crack. And so you'll get cracking on your large platters. So the alumina hydrate acts as basically ball bearings under your piece. You could also use EPK um, and alumina hydrate mixed together, which makes kiln wash, right? If you have powdered kiln wash, you could use that. Um, you can use grog, like a fine or medium mesh grog. You could use silica sand if you want as well. So any material that will not melt and stick to your shelf is what you wanna use. Some people won't use alumina hydrate because Scut doesn't recommend it because it is cur slight, they, come, they claim it slightly corrodes your elements, but I run a vent in my kiln, so my elements are not being affected by it. So for me, it's not an issue. But is it upside down? No, it's doing good. So, alrighty. So this is an E23T. Yes, that's the height of the kiln that I have is the E23T. How much alumina hydrate? About a half a tablespoon. And you sprinkle it on and then you use a brush to spread it out into a fine layer. Just a very, you don't need a lot. 
You don't need a lot, but you want it to be under the foot the whole way around, and that's why you see it, see it stuck on in places. You just want to make sure it's the whole way around the foot. This piece has two feet, has the foots, because it's such a big piece, it needs a double foot ring so that I don't get the sagging. You see how we don't have any slumping or sagging in the middle of our giant piece? So, so to reglaze, do you have to put something on it like glue? I don't. I just brush it on and it's fine when I reglaze. Um, some people have found using hairspray or spray starch first on the surface, then applying the glaze onto that because it helps it bond. So if you, if you find that the glaze isn't sticking, try one of those methods. If it sticks fine, you don't need to do that. All right. So we are going to be making, <laughs> Tracy says, clay share con surgery, moving, I need lots of ice cream. Yes. Yes, I do. All the ice cream. And hair, yeah, Christine says she's heard people use um, hairspray. On the rim of this is Georgie Sand and Surf inside, and then I brushed the Sand and Surf on the rim, just uh, one layer of it all the way around. So you can see the Sand and Surf has a lot of copper in it, and that's why we're getting the green from it. And this is with the Zinc Free Clear. Look at his He's so cute. He looks like he's about life size for my sparrow chicken. He's about that big, my bantam rooster. Yeah, he's about that tall. This is true to life here for him. So, okay. Oh, and Fran has a good suggestion. I've heard a few others. You can heat it in the microwave for about 30 seconds to warm it up. Some people use a hair dryer to heat their pieces up too to help their glaze stick to it. I mean, these are all things you can try. Um, I'm, I'm more like slap it on and it works but if there's a method that you know, if that's not working for you and one of these other methods does then you use those how do i stop slumping when firing a cake stand so sally make sure that the base where it attaches the top of the cake stand is wide enough because if it's not wide enough uh, it will slump if you have a tiny attachment here you really need to almost be out here and then come in an hourglass shape on your cake stand. And I think that's what I do on mine, is I have it really wide up in here, and then it curves out to support that. But um, don't overfire. So some of my cake stand, cake stand rules. Don't overfire. Make sure the clay you're using um, is, is a good clay for cake stands. Some clays will not work well. Porcelain, if you're going to use it, don't overfire your porcelain because that will slump really easy. Groggy clays work really well for cake stands. They help them hold up together. And uh, low fire clays are great for that. This would look in a honey glaze, you're right. And I have some more that I've made. I've got another one to glaze fire. So we will see what happens with that. All right, so next we are gonna be in the, in my prime time broadcast for my premium members. You guys, we're gonna be doing a little hand building tonight. It's the last uh, time I can make anything out of clay until after my surgery. So this is it. These are going to be the last pieces. I'm going to be using GR Pottery Forms new spherical shapes. They have that spherical triangle and spherical square. Say that three times fast. Um, so we're going to make some hand-built plates, maybe a bowl with those, uh, mostly because I'll be able to paint glaze and do some things like that, but I can't hand-build. So that's what we're going to do. All right, everybody, you take care. Have a fabulous evening. And my premium members, I'll see you in a few minutes. And we'll be doing some glazies. No, we'll be doing some plate making. I'm trying to keep track of everything. <laughs> All right, everybody on Insta, thank you. You guys got the best view of the pots tonight, I think. Look at this one. It looks spectacular and it's so big. Uh, giant, there's the rim. Big, big. I mean, you can make a giant um, 